Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Ash. I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective, and I'm really looking forward to hosting tonight's conversation between editors Nani Ferreira Matthews and Andrew Zonneveld as they discuss the release of their new collection, Why Anarchists Don't Vote, Radical Criticisms of Representative Government, out from On Our Own Authority Publishing. Before we start, if this is your first time joining an event with Firestorm, uh, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a 14-year-old worker-owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, on the traditional lands of Cherokee people. We're an anarchist collective that specializes in titles related to feminism, queerness, social movements, and radical politics. We ship books all across the country and around the world. So if you haven't checked us out yet, our full catalog is available on our website, which I will drop links to in the chat. Firestorm is also a community event space. However, due to the global pandemic, we continue to hold our community and author events entirely online. We did make an exciting announcement earlier this month that our co-op has acquired a new building and is planning to move in early 2023. The new space will have increased airflow and ventilation that will allow us to return to in-person events, which we are very excited about. Um, to make our vision possible, we are in need of some support. So if you're interested in helping us out with costs associated to the move, I'll drop a link to our crowdfunding campaign in the chat as well. And with all that said, we do have a list of exciting virtual events coming up. A week from tonight on Thursday, August 11th, we'll host, we'll host a virtual panel discussion with contributors to the new anthology, Building Power While the Lights Are Out, Disasters, Mutual Aid, and Dual Power. It's a timely collection that features some of our favorite writers, friends, and organizers. So if you're interested in signing up for that or any of the other events happening through Firestorm, you can follow us on social media and I'll also drop a link to our community calendar in the chat. A quick note for those attending in the live audience, tonight's speakers are excited to field your questions so if you're interested in asking anything, I'll encourage you to submit questions throughout the discussion by using the Q&A function located at the bottom of the screen if you're attending on Zoom or in the comments if you're following along on the Facebook live stream. Cool, moving on to tonight's event and speakers. Offering insight and clarity to the case against voting Nani Ferrara Matthews, and Andrew Zonneveld's new collection, Why Anarchists Don't Vote, gathers some of the most concise anarchist critiques against representative government and liberal electoralism of the last 150 years. Featuring essays by classic thinkers like Peter Kropotkin, Mikhail Bokunin, and Emma Goldman, along with excerpts from more contemporary writers like CLR James, Medibo Kadali, and Cindy Milstein, the collection celebrates anarchist involvement in, struggle, in struggles for labor rights, reproductive freedom, queer liberation, and anti-colonial movements, while also effectively arguing for horizontally organized, directly democratic self-governance. Nani Ferrara Matthews is a freelance journalist, independent musician, and activist currently living in Baltimore, Maryland. As an independent scholar, she has an interest in communal decision-making practices and communication styles. She studied squats, communes, and intentional communities in North America, Europe, South America, and the Middle East. Andrew Zonneveld, is an independent scholar, 
writer and musician from Atlanta, Georgia. He is the editor of The Commune, Paris, 1871, and To Remain Silent is Impossible, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman in Russia. In recent years, Andrew is well known for his work with Dr. Medivo Gadali. So Nani, Andrew, I just want to take a moment to thank you both for being here tonight and having this conversation to conversation with us. And I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Ash. Nani, you starting or I'm starting? Pardon me? I'm starting, right? You're starting? Okay, you're starting. A's first. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ash, and um, thanks to the whole team at Firestorm. Um, Firestorm Books is, I've said at every time I've been in an event with Firestorm, which has now been quite a few, and I hope there's quite a few more. Um, uh, Firestorm is far and away my favorite anarchist bookstore. Um, and I have been a fair number of places in the world, not as many as Nani, um, but, but trying to catch up. And um, and yes, Firestorm is my favorite bookstore in the world that I've been to so far. So uh, please, um, we're all very excited about their new location. And, uh, you know, which is just down the street from the old location. So don't freak out if you live in the area. Um, but uh, yeah, and if you, uh, if you can, uh, please kick them some money. Um, and also you could order this book from them or just stop by and buy it if you live in the area. Because uh, they got a whole whole mess of them. I sent them uh, uh, a week ago or so, something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks also to my esteemed colleague, Nani Ferrer Matthews. Nani is my best friend of many years. We've worked together and uh, laughed together for a long time. Um, and it's just a pleasure to actually finally get to do a, a book together. It's got both our names on the front. So I find that just a whole hell of a lot of fun. And uh, I'm glad we could do this. Um, yeah, okay. Let's talk about the book. Um, this is the book. It's called Why Anarchists Don't Vote. And um, some people have said, well, I'm an anarchist and I vote. And to them, I say, I stole the title from an essay by Elise Reclou, which is in here, or I should say, we stole the title. Um, and that was, uh, so if you're an anarchist and you vote for some reason, I'm sorry, but it seemed quite catchy. And I think there's a reason why uh, Dr. Reclou um, named his essay that, and we'll hopefully get to that uh, shortly. Um, one of the purposes of the book was to, well, it was really done to accomplish two things right off the bat, I think, and then Nani can correct me if I'm wrong. But the uh, one thing that we hoped to do was to have a collection of historical anarchist uh, writings on the subject of electoralism um, that kind of would fit together, it could be presented as, uh, as one document. So you could, if you were curious about what anarchists in history were saying about uh, electoral, electoralism or participation in elections, you have one volume where you can go to. Um, and it's, uh, we were quite selective. Uh, we went back and forth many times about what we wanted to include and, and didn't want to include. Um, and we got it down to a pretty slim volume. And um, that's also quite intentional because um, we wanted to make sure that we weren't wasting your time, um, that we didn't have arguments that were extremely repetitive, um, and that we highlighted uh, many different uh, voices from the anarchist movement in that period. Now, another thing that we wanted to accomplish with this book um, was to also make it work as sort of an introduction to anarchism itself. Um, and I think that in our introduction, um, we hope, hopefully have accomplished uh, something like that. And we'll go over some of that information here in a second. Um, but yeah, so basically we wanted it to appeal not only to people who were convinced anarchists who like 
you know, wanted a resource to study up on the intellectual tradition, but also to people who were totally new to anarchism or people who were also new to activism and maybe had encountered some anarchists and were like, why don't these anarchists want to vote for these progressive candidates or something like that? Um, and so just kind of answer that question. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully we've accomplished that. And if you have the book um, already, you can tell us whether or not you think we accomplished it. And if you don't have the book yet and you decide to pick it up after this, you can tweet us or something, I don't know. But we're looking forward to having uh, some engagement around the, you know, what was successful and not successful about the book. Um, to that end, I thought maybe it would be helpful to give a quick and dirty introduction to anarchism for anybody uh, in the, any of our attendees who might not be familiar. Um, Firestorm mentioned that they're an anarchist uh, bookshop. Um, I myself am an anarchist, um, but I find that there's a lot of uh, um, uh, misconceptions about what anarchism is and, uh, among people who are not super familiar with the tradition. So um, I wanted to just share a, a quick history of anarchism, just to kind of give an impression. And then um, later in our conversation, if people want to correct me on some stuff or add to it, um, that's totally cool. Um, okay, so anarchism, classical anarchism in the European tradition um, traces its roots back to three different philosophers. That's Pierre-Joseph uh, uh, Perdon, Mikhail Bakunin, and Peter uh, Kropotkin. Um, we don't have any essays by Proudhon in this book, but we do have an essay by uh, Mikhail Bakunin and an essay by Peter Kropotkin, um, both of whom are really like, when you think of anarchism as a, a pursuit of activists and revolutionaries and not uh, simply a, a philosophical pursuit. That's really where it starts with uh, Bakunin and, and uh, later Kropotkin. Um, anarchism as a social movement really begins in the 1870s um, and as a, a breakaway movement from the uh, International Working Men's Association. That was Karl Marx's organization. Uh, Mikhail Bakunin was in that organization with Karl Marx and they had a lot of disagreements and um, ended up going their separate ways for a number of reasons, but one of which was um, their disagreement on the role of state power and the role of really electoral politics in uh, the socialist movement. Um, so I should pause there and say that anarchism is a socialist uh, philosophy. Um, so you might have, if anybody's not familiar with anarchism, they might have seen something on HBO recently called The Anarchists, and it talks about like these cryptocurrency dudes who went to Mexico to do some kind of nonsense. They're not anarchists. Um, that's something else. Um, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not anarchism. <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I, I watched one of those episodes and was like, yeah, this is not, this is not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen quite enough. Yeah, it's 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 causing quite a lot of consternation in the in you know the movement, at least a little bit of consternation because people. It's always annoying when somebody puts the name anarchist on something and 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 it's just like some somebody doing some nonsense. Um, but yeah, so um, Bakunin breaks away from the uh, uh, International Working Men's Association. Um, and uh, he he he's writing he he's writing some, um, but he's also like a he's a really revolutionary guy. He's an on the ground kind of guy, and he's kind of bouncing from location to location, getting involved in like strikes and worker struggles and and you know fights with the police and uh, at one point trying to start a second kind of Paris commune, but not in Paris in another city in France, which I forget. Um, but in any case, uh, um, his writings kind of get taken up by uh, Peter Kropotkin, who expands on them and uh, develops what 
people consider to be the anarcho-communist thread. And um, Kropotkin's writings are voluminous, but as Nani reminded me last night, Kropotkin really preferred to write small pamphlets um, and not, uh, not huge tones. And in that, in that part of that effort was to make sure you could, you could reach the people you were trying to reach. You know, if you're a working class socialist movement, uh, you know, sometimes you got to produce things that people who have to work for long fucking hours can read and have time to read in one sitting and, uh, and can, you know, take something away from. And uh, so he wrote a lot, but he wrote it in sections and small pamphlets that could be read one right after the other. And uh, um, it's worth noting that the anarchist movement at the time being a working class movement, being something where people would be reading this stuff while they were at work in factories, you know, you'd have like one, one guy on the job whose job it was to like read. And then they would, you know, they would alternate or something like that in many places in, in Europe and in the States. Um, that kind of working class intellectual culture was, was very much, uh, anarchism was entangled with that uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and so, yeah, and Kapanian's work basically influences all of the rest of the writers who are in this volume. Um, and a couple of them I just want to highlight. Uh, there's more than I'm, than I'm going to speak about uh, today, but a couple of them I want to highlight to kind of give you a sense of the diversity of the anarchist movement in this period of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, the first person I want to talk about is uh, this woman who's on the cover here. This is Lucy Parsons. Um, Lucy Parsons is a fascinating uh, figure. She was born into slavery in Texas. Um, she married a former Confederate soldier named Albert Parsons. Her birth name was Lucy Adeline Gonzalez. Um, she was born to slavery. She married uh, Albert Parsons, who was a former Confederate soldier who actually had was, was filled with remorse for having participated in the, uh, in the Confederacy because he had followed his brother into it and, and eventually broke with it. Um, and he became a radical Republican. If you know anything about that period, the Republican Party, especially the radical Republicans, they were the party of reconstruction. And um, so they were essentially like the abolitionist aspect of the party um, post-abolition. Uh, and uh, Parsons and Gonzaga, and Albert and Lucy got married. Um, and uh, they got chased out of Texas by the Klan. Um, they moved to Chicago, uh, where they began working with the socialist movement. And Chicago is a, at the time, and still is, um, a kind of a hub for a lot of Eastern European immigrants at the time. And uh, they meet anarchists. Um, if I didn't mention before, Mikhail Bakunin was from Russia, Peter Kropotkin was from Russia, um, and Eastern Europe was uh, a hotbed of anarchist activity, and Eastern European immigrants brought knowledge of those uh, intellectual traditions and philosophies to the States when they moved here for work. So Lucy and Albert meet a lot of Eastern European immigrants in Chicago, um, they become involved in the anarchist movement um, as writers and uh, agitators. Um, this is after many unsuccessful Socialist Party electoral campaigns, uh, and they become convinced that there's not any way to enact socialism through elections. It's part of their push that makes them into anarchists, and along with their the good company of uh, many immigrant anarchists. Um, Albert and several other uh, anarchists are framed for the bombing and murder of uh, some police officers. They're put on trial 
and uh, four of them, including Albert, are executed. Uh, that's Lucy's husband, uh, with whom she had two children. Um, and after Albert's death, she continues to be one of the most fiery and well-known uh, anarchist agitators uh, in US history. And um, uh, she, in 1905, was one of the co-founders of the Industrial Workers of the World, um, the IWW, which, was, which is one of the most, probably the most radical union uh, in US labor history. Um, and she died in the 1940s in a house fire, and she was in her 90s. And there's a lot of um, speculation that the Chicago police actually set that fire to kill her, but I don't think that was ever um, uh, proven. Um, so that's Lucy. The next person I want to talk about is uh, Shisui Kotoku. Kotoku Shisui, actually, I guess you should say. Um, and uh, this is a drawing of Kotoku that uh, uh, our friend Julia did for another book project that hasn't uh, come to fruition yet, but hopefully will. Um, he was a member of the Japanese Socialist Party. He was a very famous journalist in Japan at one time. Um, he uh, was jailed uh, for writing socialist articles in mainstream newspapers. It was a violation of the press laws in Japan at the time. Um, while he was in jail, he began corresponding with uh, IWW organizers. This was the very beginning of the IWW, 1904, 1905. Um, Kotoku was, somebody in the States, in California, had heard about his case, and um, um, which actually always fascinates me because like there was so much communication all around the world at the time, and they didn't have nearly the communication tools we have now. Um, it's really impressive that correspondence people kept with one another, but anyway, um, after he gets out of jail, Kotoku decides to go meet some of his pen pals in uh, California because he's never been to, to uh, North America before. So he gets on a boat and uh, with his nephew and travels to San Francisco where he um, meets his friends and he stays at uh, an Eastern European woman's house and she framed a picture of Kropotkin over uh, the bed in the guest room where Kotoku is staying. Um, and he learns a lot about anarchism from, uh, again, Eastern European immigrants and also uh, from IWW organizers who, by the way, at the time, it's the only union that was opposing uh, the Chinese exclusion and uh, uh, Japanese exclusion because there was a lot of um, these white, majority white unions were essentially trying to, they were anti-immigrant because it was this idea of uh, American jobs for American workers and some you know, racist shit like that. So uh, Kotoku um, got close with the IWW members um, and he also helped to organize a, a Japanese American anarchist group in San Francisco at the time. Um, and while he's in California, he witnesses the 1905 uh, Great, San Francisco, the Great San Francisco earthquake, I think it's called. And it was a horrible, horrible event. Uh, one of the worst uh, earthquakes in uh, California's history. Um, and the aftermath of the earthquake, there were fires. The, the city basically burns. Um, and while this is happening, Kotoku uh, notices that in the aftermath, um, there was this amazing uh, instinct for mutual aid and solidarity that just emerged among people. Um, you know, people who had been rich, people who had been poor, were kind of all helping each other out. Uh, you know, barriers of class and race seem to break down um, in this, the aftermath of this horrible disaster. And he wrote at one point in his correspondence that uh, for 10 days after the earthquake, all of San Francisco lived under anarchist communism, at least in their hearts. And uh, it made a big impression on him, this idea for direct action and mutual aid. You know, the state was nowhere to be seen in the aftermath of this earthquake. There, Nobody was coming to help or rescue anybody and the people they had to do it themselves. And, and um, as we see in many natural disasters, they, um, even today, you know, we see the same thing happen. Um, 
and uh, he returns to Japan and he gives a speech before the rest of the Japanese Socialist Party and he and he says, you know, we got to stop messing around with these elections and trying to get people, you know, elected uh, at, into the Diet, which is the representative but legislative body in Japan. He said we have to uh, we need to take on a more direct action oriented approach. And that speech is reproduced here in the book. Um, and um, yeah, totally worth reading. We, we're not planning on reading it tonight, but if we have like lots of time and nothing else to do, we certainly could. Um, but yeah, it's, it's reproduced here in the book. It's called The Change in My Thought on Universal Suffrage. And uh, absolutely worth reading. Um, and just quickly, um, a couple of, of the other contributors. Um, a very famous Emma Goldman, one of the most famous anarchists uh, in the world, um, who was herself an Eastern European immigrant from uh, Lithuania, was today Lithuania. Um, she uh, was jailed for advocating birth control, um, and she was eventually deported along with her partner, Alexander Berkman, whose work is also included in the book, um, was deported for anti-war uh, activities during World War I. Um, she's also known for her early LGBT activism and advocacy. Uh, she was famous for giving speeches on sociology um, when she was being repressed. For, uh, when she wasn't allowed to give speeches on anarchism, she would kind of subvert that by booking tours related to sociology. And she would talk a lot about uh, queer liberation. Um, this is you know, over a hundred years ago. And I, I've always really appreciated um, that story about Emma Goldman because it, it wasn't just Emma Goldman, but there were there were anarchists who have been doing queer liberation work for well over a hundred years, and um, that often gets uh, I think overlooked in uh, the history of the movement. Um, there's also Elise Ray Clou's work is included in this book. Um, he was a famous geographer. He was the chair of geography at the University of Brussels. Um, and, and a prolific anarchist writer. Uh, he was opposed to marriage and advocated for free unions, is what he called them, uh, that didn't involve the church or the state. Um, and both of his daughters actually uh, got you know, married in free unions uh, without, and it was quite a scandal um, uh, in his home in France at the time. Um, and uh, last but not least, there's Errico Malatesta, who was an Italian anarchist and a syndicalist from Italy. Syndicalism is an emphasis on labor. It it's, um, has to do with unions being able to confederate and the working class being able to govern society from uh, their own unions and the point of production. Um, he had to flee Italy several times in his life. Uh, he lived in exile in London for a while. Uh, he actually went to Egypt and fought against the English in the Anglo-Egyptian War. Um, he was later arrested in Italy for his particip participation in strikes and fighting with the cops and uh, all sorts of cool stuff like that. Um, he escaped uh, from prison in Italy, returned to London. Uh, and then came back to Italy when Mussolini was in power to write anti-fascist literature um, under the extremely repressive Mussolini regime, uh, and you know later died in uh, uh, 1932. Um, but yeah, it's just a little a little bit about the origins of anarchism and as a as a working class freedom movement and. Uh, uh, gives a little context for their writings on uh, electoralism and the rejection of, of the ballot. And with that, um, which lasted way longer than I intended, I would like to <laughs> pass it off to <laughs> my distinguished co-author, Nani Ferrer Matthews. Thank you. Uh, have a swig of sweet tea, take a breather. Um, yeah, so thanks to Firestorm for having us tonight. I know that Andrew and I have talked about these topics for over a decade. Um, fiery late night conversations about why everyone doesn't get it yet. Oh. <laughs> I really hope that this book kind of just breaks through all of the noise and offers 
um, just a very clear vision on what anarchism is and what electoral politics will never actually accomplish. Um, and we know this and, and you'll, you'll know it too. So uh, I'll start with, um, uh, I think it was like back in 2018, I called Andrew, I just moved to Baltimore. I'd been here for maybe one year and I called him because I uh, had seen this idea kind of crop up in that year um, uh, around this idea called harm reduction voting. So I recall back in 2018, I was walking around during the midterm elections and you know, just like every election, it was the most important election. You had to get out, you had to vote. And I would, was walking by signs that just read vote Democrat, not even like vote for a specific candidate. It just said vote Democrat. And then uh, around that same time, I saw a lot of harm reduction voting posts on Instagram. Um, and some of these posts were made by some of the more radical accounts that I follow. So this made me think um, I should look into this and look in and answer the question, what is harm reduction voting? And so what I found was that harm reduction philosophy has its roots in the social justice movement for the rights of drug users. And one of the movement's main purposes or principles is the understanding that while drug use is dangerous, it is inevitable. And that there are some ways uh, that are using drugs are safer than others. So needle exchanges are an example of harm reduction in practice. So in line with this principle, some voters were choosing at that time and still um, uh, to enact their limited power in a per, an oppressive system by voting for candidates that, I mean, basically voting for candidates that they hope were least likely to fuck up the world, right? And so behind all of the posts and memes that I saw back in 2018 was just a powerful rebranding campaign for what we already called lesser evil voting. Um, so we talk about this in the introduction, but shame and guilt are the primary tactics for, the, for voter mobilization of the Democratic Party. I've seen that my whole life. So when my peers were saying voting is harm reduction, I had to ask harm reduction for who exactly? Is it harm reduction to vote for candidates who push to secure for more civil liberties at home, but then endorse a lot of wars, endless wars and murder abroad? You know, is it harm reduction to support leftist candidates who say they'll change things from the inside? Like Bernie Sanders is a very popular example um, who still supports is Israeli apartheid. And he opposes uh, BDS or boycott divestments and sanctions, which is a nonviolent Palestinian led peace movement that started back in 2005 with the goal of ending international support of Israelis oppression of Palestinians. Is it harm reduction to vote for Joe Biden who just last month visited Israel for the 10th time in his political career and said, quote, you need not be a Jew to be a Zionist. Further celebrating his lifelong relationship with the apartheid state and erasing the Palestinian people and their struggle for freedom. So those are some of the ideas around harm reduction. Um, we also talk in the introduction a little bit about the pamphlet voting is, it's quote, voting is not harm reduction in indigenous perspective. And that's from the anti-colonial organization called Indigenous Action. And they write, among several other questions, here's a couple that they present um, in their pamphlet. So when it comes to harm reduction voting, it's never clear how harm is actually calculated. Do we add up what political party conducted more drone strikes? Do we add up what political party had the highest military budget? And so on and so forth, they ask these questions um, to demonstrate basically that there's no way to really quantify what harm redu reduction voting is. And even more than that, we should reject the idea that the state through its own institutions could ever meaningfully reduce its own harmful behaviors. Um, you know, states depend on violence. We know this, states depend on violence of policing, incarceration and war to maintain uh, the rule over territory and its population. So in fact, they impose their systems of oppression on indigenous communities and have actually, they actually have the audacity to say voting is power or to use your vote or to let your voice be heard. And again, this is stuff I've definitely heard my whole life. Um, and I, I guess it wasn't in my introduction, but it might be beneficial to note that my mother is a native Hawaiian. She was born in 56, uh, US, the US annexed Hawaii as a state in 59. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, she's native Hawaiian and there's a, anyway, there's a whole lot about native Hawaii or native Hawaiian and the struggle of Hawaii and the occupation of Hawaii. If you ever have the opportunity, I highly recommend reading this book 
Hawaiian blood. It's really, really good. That's by uh, Jay Kaolani Kaonua. So anyway, what I was saying was the, the US basically occupies an indigenous people and their land and then they give them the right to vote. And then that's how you enact power. But you have to ask like, am I really, do I really have power in this situation? So Hawaii, as an example, was actually a sovereign and recognized nation state with several signed treaties over the course of 20 years from about 1850 to 1870. And they were recognized as their own sovereign nation state. But this power was actually usurped by businessmen uh, from the US in 1887. There was a militia associated with the US military called the Honolulu Rifles, and they seized points in the city and forced the king at the time to sign what they called, quote, the Bayonet Constitution, which created a new constitution that gave US citizens the right to vote in Hawaiian elections and excluded many native Hawaiians. Um, it also was a very racist uh, constitution that divided Asians and white settlers and Hawaiians in a way that would act, give them access to voting, which was the power that they were saying that they had. Um, then the oligarchs created a new cabinet after they overthrew the king and stripped power from him. And then of course this constitution was never ratified by the House of Nobles or the Hawaiian House of Nobles at the time. And the last queen, Queen Lilio Kalani, she attempted to replace the bayonet constitution and then she was overthrown in 1893 by the, by the businessmen. And I mean, I think some people know the story that the first president of Hawaii after this is uh, Dole, like the president of Dole Industries. Um, but this is actually a prime example of how voting was used as a mean of, means of control and not as a pathway to freedom. So they had constructed this entire situation in which you could vote, but then eliminated the voices um, of the native people and then gave themselves all the power. And so I, I guess that kind of brought me into this idea of uh, um, Ellis, LSA Recluse essay, Why Anarchists Don't Vote. And he kind of right away gets to the point in the first two sentences, he says, everything that can be said about suffrage may be summed up in a sentence. To vote is to give up your own power. Which actually when I was looking it up earlier this week, Nancy Pelosi actually said in 2006 that voting is power. So then I have to ask what power for who? The same thing as harm reduction for who? Power for who? Is it power for the elite, for the business people, power for the landowners. It's definitely not power for the indigenous populations whose lands were stolen and stolen by the vote, no less. So the US do give the people of Hawaii another vote in 1959 after stripping them of their lands and their rights. Uh, in 1959, they get the ballot for statehood where citizens were presented with two options. The options were to incorporate as a state or remain a US colonial territory. And by this point, over 50 years have passed uh, and the settlers and military personnel far outnumbered Hawaiians and Hawaii became a state by vote, an unlawful vote. So this goes back to the idea of power, which I'm kind of covering a little bit here and there, but if we had direct power in voting, then we would set the agenda as voters, which we clearly don't set the agenda. Some of these essays, I was talking to Ash whenever we jumped on the call, but some of these are over 150 years old and they're still as relevant today as they were back then because the circumstances are very much the same. Um, so some people might ask and often do when we present these kind of ideas, like how do we get power? How can we control our own lives? And um, wow, there's so many great examples. So Firestorm is a worker-owned co-op. I work as a worker-owned co-op. Uh, worker owner at a co-op here in Baltimore. Um, so there's tons of ways in, to eradicate hierarchy. There's non-hierarchical cons consensus-based decision-making, which is something that, uh, that I came across at Occupy Wall Street, which was, I think I was already very radical at the time, but that was my aha moment when I saw consensus decision-making versus majority rule. And Lucy Parsons has a good essay in here called Ballot Humbug, where she goes through and just is like, if you have person A and B and C and all of these different scenarios, who has power over who and how majority rule doesn't work. Um, and I mean, she saw it clearly in, in the early 1900s and it hasn't changed at all. Um, 
but I think what really drew me into Occupy Wall Street was that it was anarchy, but in the most beautiful way possible. It was people on the ground, ready to organize, ready to occupy public spaces. And it started in New York City, it went all over. Andrew was in Atlanta with it. I know that some of the founders of um, my company, Thread Coffee Roasters, they were involved here in Baltimore in the movement. And it changed a lot of people's minds about what anarchism really was or what it could be when you can see it in action. You know, when there was general assemblies of hundreds of people in lower Manhattan and the agenda was being set at that time by the people there. It was uh, the working groups that split into categories like outreach or art or communication. It was creating and disseminating information uh, in newspapers that were free. It was anarchism and it was beautiful. And when I think of voting as an access to any kind of beauty, I just don't see a comparison in the least. Um, and then Andrew had a book that he wanted to share from Cindy that kind of will showcase some of these ideas in practice. Yeah, thanks, Nani. And you know, I mean, just briefly to comment on some of what you shared right there. Um, and I know that we were talking last night and um, what you shared about uh, Hawaiian history and also what the, um, the authors of uh, the, the authors from Indigenous Action who wrote the uh, voting is not harm reduction pamphlet, what they also related, like this idea that like, um, that somebody's ancestral homeland can be occupied by a, a state power that imposed upon them and then be told like, get out and vote for somebody to rule you on, you know, I mean, it, it's, I, I, I'm not an indigenous person and I, I, you know, I can't, I'm sure I can't entirely grasp how infuriating that that would make me, but like, I, like, I think about it a lot. And um, yeah, so I, I don't know, I was, I was very moved by that and I appreciate you for, for sharing. Um, the, uh, book that Nani mentioned that we do want to plug because the afterword in our volume was written by our uh, wonderful friend, uh, Cindy Milstein. And uh, uh, it's a kind of an updated draft of an essay that Cindy wrote for their book uh, called um, Anarchism and Its Aspirations. Actually, I think it might even predate that book. But the afterword is called Democracy is Direct. And um, so one of the things when you're an anarchist and you tell somebody that you're not really all that keen on voting, um, they, they start, people ask you questions, which is fine because, you know, that's how you learn. And um, but one thing people always say, you know, when you start talking about being opposed to representative government and you start talking about like what Nani was saying, um, you know, these consensus models of decision making and, and like and these directly democratic ideas of like how people can govern themselves without a, uh, a state over them. Um, people say, oh, well, where has that worked? Or, or I've never, where, where are they doing that? Well, answering that question a couple of years ago, uh, Cindy Milstein uh, put forward this volume called uh, Deciding for Ourselves, The Promise of Direct Democracy. And in this book, this book is an edited volume that contains essays from a number of different authors, all of whom have been involved in directly democratic movements, places, spaces, revolutions happening right now in the 21st century, um, or some that happened you know, in decades past, but most of them are very recent. Um, and uh, one of the examples in this that uh, I uh, really appreciate is recently in a town called Chiron in, in Mexico, uh, where the wonderful one that a lot of them happen in Mexico. And the reason for that is that there is a, uh, a loophole in the Mexican constitution, which allows for indigenous self-governance. 
and indigenous peoples in Mexico uh, use that in order to, when they feel like it, kick the government out of, uh, you know, their hometowns. Um, and so in this town of Chiran, uh, the local indigenous leadership effectively banned political parties from coming around. And uh, they no longer hold elections in the same way that we're used to. They uh, have a completely different indigenous system for, um, actually it's based on neighborhood bonfires where people regularly gather to discuss the issues of the day facing their communities. And um, then they select a representative from the bonfires to relate those issues that talk together in a kind of bonfire of bonfires, but they're not paid and they're uh, revocable, uh, instantly revocable if they do something uh, that the neighborhood doesn't approve of. And so it creates this kind of inverted uh, system from what we're used to where we elect somebody in, you know, in the representative government system that we have, which is, they call democracy, which is not democracy, um, is, is really a republicanism. Um, but in this republican system, uh, we elect somebody to go and govern for us. The assumption being that we don't have the time or the smarts to do it ourselves. And um, so Cindy's book, Deciding for Ourselves, which I really encourage people to read, um, documents on how direct democracy is accomplished in places today. Um, yeah, uh, that being said, I think that, um, Nani, was there anything else that, uh, we, that you wanted to discuss or we were supposed to discuss? I know we were going to do a, a, a little reading from the book. Uh, While you were talking about the example from Cindy's book, I just remember, uh, this actually doesn't really have anything to do with the book. It was just this moment where I, I was with some friends a couple of weeks ago. And we were playing a very complicated card game. <laughs> one of those card games where you're like, I'll never be able to figure this out no matter how many times you tell me. And then 30 minutes later, we had figured it out and we're playing many rounds. And I, it was that moment I was like, if we can do this, we could rethink society, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> no, other than that, I think we were gonna try to read. I don't know if we have enough time though. I think we do. Uh... But uh, maybe, I don't know, what do you, we thought, okay, so here's what, what we had proposed, dear attendees. Um, there's a wonderful pamphlet by uh, Erico Malatesta in um, this book. Um, and uh, the way that Malatesta wrote it is it's like a little dialogue, it's like a little play. Um, and it kind of goes through the object, basically objections to voting and the objections to the objections. It takes place with two, two guys hanging at a bar complaining about the price of beer turns into why you shouldn't vote. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't know, it might, it might be, a, how long does it take? 15 minutes? Yeah, about 15. And then we'd, we'd still have- 30. Oh, that's just do it. Huh? Oh, Ash says do it. Okay. Okay. We should do it. Wait, who's, who's, okay. So the two characters, George, George and Jack. And Jack. Like names. And, um, uh, wait, who's, you're Jack and I'm George. Is that what it is? That's correct. Okay. Okay. So the stage is set. Imagine a pub. Uh, this is in, this is definitely in London. Um, where he's writing this from. And you'll hear reference to the Labor Party uh, in this. Uh, and so when they say Labor can elect people or, or vote Labor or something like that, that, that's the Labor Party we're talking about. We're talking about in the UK. Um, okay, I'll give it a go. This beer is not too bad, is it? Yeah, it's all right, but what a price. Shocking, especially when you remember what things used to cost. Still, you can't wonder with all these taxes. It costs you twice as much to live as it used to. They put up the price of some things and say you can do without them, but you can't do without bread and food and clothes, and you have to pay the rent all the same, and then there are the taxes on this and the rates on that, 
and our wages too, what a life, and it's our own fault. If we wanted to, we could alter things. The working class has the remedy in its own hands. Why, what's your remedy? Easy enough, you got the vote. What's that got to do with it? Well, have you or haven't you? Well, I'm entitled to vote, but I never make use of it. Well, there you are. You've got the vote, but you just won't take the trouble to use it. And then you wonder why things are so bad. You deserve all you get, honestly. Oh, people like you are responsible for all the trouble in the world. All right, all right, keep your hair on. Just tell me what's the good of voting? It's obvious, who makes the laws? The MPs, elect good MPs, you get good laws. Good counselors and good MPs? We've heard that for a long time, but you'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to notice. It's the same stooges that get in. Oh, it's wonderful to hear them when they're after the votes at election time. They pat you on the back, ask after the wife and kids, kiss the baby, promise you railways, bridges, work, cheap bread, less taxes, higher wages, protection, absolutely everything. And once they get in, they're no better than anyone. Goodbye promises. The wife and kids may starve and there's no more or less work than before. The whole town can be falling to pieces for all they care. They have other things to think about than your troubles. Then a few years later, they start the ballyhoo again. It doesn't matter what color the party is, they're all the same. As soon as they're elected, they forget all about you. They're in their clubs and at their select dinners and they don't even trouble to come and have a look at you until next election. That's correct, but why elect the rich? Don't you know that the rich only live on the work of the masses? So how do you expect them to worry about the masses? All they think of is getting as much out of the ordinary man as they can. Now you're talking, but it's, only, it's not only the rich, there's the other type who wanna get elected so they can become rich. That's true, so let's don't vote for them. Let's elect workers, experienced friends of ours, as you might say, and then we won't be fooled. Oh, we've got some of your experienced friends in now, and they're no different from our acknowledged enemies. Anyhow, what could you mean, let's elect, let's elect, as if we, you and me, could do as we like? But it's not only us two. If each, of, if each one of us tried to convert other people, and then they would do the same, Labor, Labor Party, would have a majority, and we could elect whomever we liked. And that's when we could form a government of the workers, and then... Then it would be a paradise. I mean, for those who are in parliament, you're arranging things a bit too quickly. Those in command always have the majority. The rich are always in power. Just imagine a poor worker, perhaps with an ill wife and four hungry kids, and you'd tell him to risk his job and get thrown out of his house just to starve, just to give his vote to a candidate his master doesn't like. Just try and convince those poor devils who can be thrown out of work by their bosses whenever he likes. They're never free. If they want to be free, they don't want to waste time voting. Just take what they need. But if we didn't do that, no one would vote. We couldn't go to the workers and ask them to vote for our party and say at the same time that the votes were useless. That's just it. And on, the top, and on top of that, you have to make election promises you know you can't keep. And then you have to stand in with the government and mix with the well-to-dos and all the rest of it. And soon, and... As soon as any of your men are elected, they have to kowtow to the people you admit are the opponents of the workers. So why the hell talk about propaganda when the first thing you do is counteract propaganda? But you must admit, it's an advantage to have our own men uh, with a voice in affairs. An advantage for themselves and maybe for some of their friends, but what for the mass of the people? Tell it to the Marines. You can see what happens as soon as the MPs get elected. Socialists go to the Tories and they become independents and other brands of opportunists. Oh, you're too severe. We know men are only men and we have to stand for some weaknesses. But the thing to do is to choose the best men, not always the same ones. At that rate, you'll be mass producing racketeers if you keep changing the candidates. Haven't we got enough traitors? All those who pass through the mill are ground to flour. As soon as you send someone to office, they turn traitor. They mix with the rich and want to keep up with them. I'm willing to admit a man is a, a genuine socialist when he gives up his time and his energy, his money and his ability, exposes himself to imprisonment and victimization just to, for, to fight corruption and capitalism. But these MPs of yours are only professing socialists, running with the hare and hunting with the hounds, on par with the professing Christians who preach loving kindness and are the worst swindlers of the lot. Well, now you're going too far. 
Among the socialist leaders you insult are men who have known what it is to go hungry, who have worked and suffered for the cause, who have given proof. Get away with your proof. Even Hitler went hungry and worked for his cause. Have we got to respect him now? He's become a scoundrel of the lowest order. It's the respect for leaders that has brought socialism down. Socialism should have been the hope of the people and your leaders have made it a curse. As soon as you get labor men in government, do you call that propaganda? Still, if you're not satisfied with certain leaders, you can get rid of them. The voters can choose whom they like. Can they? What choice has anyone ever got? You can vote for Tweedledum. If you don't like him, you can have Tweedledee. Instead of throwing smoke in people's eyes about this voting business, you ought to destroy their confidence in the whole electoral setup, whether for parliament or the councils. The most important causes of misery are first, private ownership, which prevents a man from working unless he submits to those who own the land and the tools and accepts their conditions. And secondly, government, which protects the exploiters and takes part in exploitation. Well, of course, you have to convince people that their interests are in voting for their own candidate in order, to, in order to defy their bosses. We have to organize to prevent the exploiter from crushing the liberties of the people. Just in order to vote for Mr. Jones or Mr. Brown, of course we should organize, but not just to add one more member to parliament. We want to organize to convince the people that we've been robbed of all the good things of the world, that we have the right to take the whole of our our own products, and we can do, do it without taking orders from anyone. Yes, but you must always have someone in charge to get things organized. Not at all. But the people are too ignorant to run the whole affairs of life themselves. Ignorant? If they weren't ignorant... I think I lost I, for them. If you had only left them alone and didn't mislead them, you want us to govern for our own good. You lost your place? Oh, I treat us like cattle. Besides, oh, sorry. Besides, uh, you say that people are too ignorant to have freedom, but you think that they are clever enough to elect MPs. And if they vote for your candidates, you say they're full of wisdom. Isn't it easier to look after your own business than to get someone else to do it? If MPs wanted to defend our interests, they'd ask what we wanted and how we wanted it and not ask us to get them to act as they like and betray us whenever they like. Still, people can't do everything themselves. There must be someone to look after the public interest in politics. What do you mean politics? If you mean the art of fooling people all the time, I can assure you that we don't mind doing that, doing without it. But if you mean by politics, the general interest, we all know how to drink and amuse ourselves. I'm damned if I'll go to a specialist if I want to blow my nose and then give him the right to squeeze it, squeeze it if I don't blow it the way he likes. The shoemaker makes the shoes, the builders make the house. Nobody ever thought about make, giving shoemakers and builders the right to order us around and starve us out. These men who want to get into parliament for the sake of public welfare, what do they do for the people? When were the socialist MPs and borough councilors ever better than anyone else? No, they're all the same breed. So you attack the socialists too. You forget that they are so few in number. They have to have the majority. And besides, their hands are tied. Then why do they accept office when their hands are tied? There's only one reason. They want to look after their own interests. Well, you're an anarchist, of course. Yes, I am. So what? Well, anarchism seems to me to be a bit too advanced. I'm a socialist. You're right in a lot of things. But if I'd known you were an anarchist at first, I wouldn't have told you that we could get better conditions through parliament. Because I know that so long as there are poor, the laws will be made by the rich and always to their own advantage. Oh, I see. You know improvements won't come through parliament, but you still tell people to vote. When you know I'm an anarchist, you know I won't believe that fairy story about voting for progress. So you admit that you know yourself, you're getting people to vote for certain candidates, we'll never, but it will never bring them what they promise them. I know you're not being paid to lie and deceive the masses, so what makes you do it then? No, 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 hold your horses. If I tell people to give their votes, it's for the sake of propaganda. Don't you see how good it is to have some of our own men in parliament? 
they can make propaganda better than anyone else. They can say things about socialism that we'd be run in for. And then, and when they speak, the papers will report it. Oh, so it's for propaganda you turn the election agent, is it? Some propaganda. Listen, first you tell the people to hope and expect everything from parliament, that revolution isn't necessary, that all the worker has to do is slip a little piece of paper into a box and then you'll, and then you'll do the rest. Then you admit that this won't really achieve anything. It's only propaganda. Isn't this propaganda exactly opposite to your own ideas? The rich will always defend those two institutions desperately, whatever the cost. Deceit and lies have always been used and they don't stop at the jail, the gallows and machine guns. Elections are no use against that. We don't want a change of masters, but a complete revolution, making an absolute break with the past. We must have a genuine commonwealth where everyone is certain of food, clothing, and shelter. The landowners must be ejected by the farm workers so they can work the land for themselves and everyone else. The workers must kick out their bosses and organize production for the common good. They must get together and refuse to tolerate any government whatever. Agreement must be made in every district between everyone and the same job. The workers must run the places of work and every district must be linked up in a common bond of industrial unity. And it will certainly succeed when everyone's interests depend on it. We won't fight amongst ourselves any longer or tolerate war between workers of different nations. War and competition will disappear. Machinery won't turn people out of work, but will help them make it more agreeable and productive and less wearisome. There'll be no more untilled land. We won't just produce a tenth of what we need as we do now. On the contrary, we shall employ all known methods in order to increase the quantity of food and the quality of products. The whole of society will be one union of producers and consumers. Look, all of this is very well, but it's very difficult to bring about. Your ideal is magnificent, but there's one drawback. How are you going to put it into practice? I agree that revolution is the only salvation, but whatever we do, it's, it's impossible now, and we must make the best of what we can, and that is electioneering. What do you want us to do? Why, why don't you come in and help us instead of remaining outside and criticizing? Now, I haven't yet spoken of what we anarchists are doing, but I'll tell you this, that you socialists are one of the big obstacles. Our activities have been paralyzed for years because of your propaganda for par parliamentarianism, and you're deluding the workers to trust those who have betrayed them. We have to waste time counteracting your propaganda then when we could be pushing forward to social revolutionary change. I hope more and more people get disgusted with trusting your party. It's the only way we'll ever get the re revolutionary feeling. Well, hurry up and make your revolution then. And you can be sure the mass of our people will be on your side if it ever came to revolution. The rank and file, anyhow. Oh, I see. Make the re revolution and we'll join you. If you believe in revolution, why not help us make it? To tell you the truth, if I thought revolution was in any way practicable now, I wouldn't mind going over to you. I admit this election business makes me sick, and I'd like to let some of our leaders go to hell. But I honestly can't see where we could do anything about revolution today. All you want to know is what you want and put energy into it, and you'll soon find what could be done. First of all, we have to propagate real socialism, and instead of spinning yarns about trusting politicians and voting for people, getting people to despise the parliamentary racket and the whole political machine. Let the rich do the electing by themselves while the whole public despises them for it. When the workers lose faith in the ballot box swindle, they'll see the necessity for social revolution. Let's go to election meetings if you like and expose the lies and pretenses of various candidates. Let's make propaganda, not among the rich in Westminster, but among the workers organizations and in factories and create new groups and explain to everyone how the workers can emancipate themselves. Let's take an active part in strikes and create a gulf between the wage slaves and the bosses. Let's be on the spot whenever there's a struggle between the people and their rulers and give the movement of struggle a conscience. Let's get among the masses suffering injustice, forced discipline, privatization, and no matter where it is and create a movement that's going to struggle against the ruling class. Once we have the movement going, ideas come by themselves. Let's always be in the midst of the masses and let them understand what they should be after. They themselves must struggle for freedom. It can't be done for them and we must be in their midst. And while we do all this, let's approach people who feel like we do 
and slowly and steadily begin to understand and accept ideas with those we must unite and prepare the elements for general and decisive action for the emancipation of the working class. Well, let's shake hands on that. They can go to hell with their elections. I want to learn more of anarchism. Anyway, that's from uh, uh, Malatesta's pamphlet, which was not dated. The oldest version I could find was, was from after his death and it was published in like 1950 but it was definitely written before that because like I said, uh, the dude was dead. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so if the language was a bit dated, uh, I probably should have mentioned before that this pamphlet was probably written in the uh, late 20s, early 30s. Um, but yeah, I think with that, we really love, I think we lost some people during that. Um, and <laughs> for the remainder of you, thank you for sticking, sticking it out as we uh, had a bit of fun reading this old dialogue and we'd love to open it up to uh, some question and answer, get some conversation going. And Ash, if you wouldn't mind emceeing that, please. For sure, since I'm the only person on camera here, I'll, I'll start with a little round of applause for y'all. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> It was, uh, you know, it, it was a very fascinating exchange, uh, and everybody shook hands at the end. Amazing, amazing that uh, mind was in the midst of a fifteen-minute conversation. Yeah, um, it's great how conversations can go when one person writes the, both parts. You know, that's true. Um, well, great. We already have uh, a a good question submitted here. Um, so for folks who are still in the room, uh, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to hear your questions, comments, thoughts. Um, you can share them there. Um, but yeah, let's just dive into this first question here. It comes from Demetrius, and I am just going to read it. Um, so they ask, Many of the classic anarchist revolutionaries in their writings appear to be against democracy of any kind due to conflating it with majoritarian rule. How do modern anarchists, such as ourselves, with our promotion of direct democracy engage with this sort of critique? Um, so I think this, uh, Demetrius is pointing out the fact that anarchism uh, is not a monolith. There is lots of uh, diversity of thought within uh, anarchism, um, and there are critiques of democracy itself. Um, so would Andrew or Nani, do either of you want to take a first stab at this question? Andrew, you, you should try that one. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I want to thank Demetrius uh, for the question. Um, and it's, a, it's an excellent question. And I think that um, in answering this question, we can clear up a lot of uh, misunderstandings with regard to like anar historical anarchist perspectives on the idea of democracy, um, which uh, for better or worse, uh, have, as Ash has alluded to, carried forward in uh, to more um, modern iterations. But um, so yes, is this conflation of democracy with majoritarian rule. Um, and I think that like what Nani was saying earlier about direct democracy being uh, uh, something other than having one question, yes or no, um, and then like sculpted by, you know, a small number, the question itself even sculpted by a small number of people. Um, and then uh, the ma a mass of people kind of voting yay or nay on this one idea, which is even like, even that's much more, you know, democratic than what we practice in the United States. But like that, that essentially, that's not how in practice direct democracy has worked. Um, it, it's not a majority rule situation in the sense of the, the, like the majority of opinion is just imposed upon everybody no matter what. Um, and I think like Nani was saying, and like I was mentioning earlier with the example from Chiron, is that when we think about direct democracy, we have to think about these more communitarian um, mechanisms for 
groups of people governing themselves, deciding uh, together what they were going to do about this or that issue. That's democracy. Um, and actually, my, my dear friend Modibo Kadali writes excellently on this question. Um, and he puts forward an idea of intimate direct democracy. And he even has a book called that, which is here, um, Intimate Direct Democracy. And part of his argument is that what makes democracy work at the community level is this idea of intimacy. It's knowing the people around you, knowing the people who are in the decisions, knowing their motivations, knowing, uh, you know, knowing your neighbor and, you know, their character. And that, that, that is this kind of qualitative quality um, to community self-government that uh, so often gets uh, um, overlooked in studies of, uh, of democracy. Now, with regard to historical anarchists and, um, and the idea of democracy, what Demetrius is pointing out is a really good point. Um, like even Malatesta, who most anarchists consider to be like, really like a very direct democracy oriented guy. Um, Malatesta wrote, you know, essays called Against Democracy. And the democracy against was what nation states at the time and still are, um, were calling democracy, which was a system of, of voting for leaders. Um, so the system of voting for leaders com being conflated with democracy uh, inspired a lot of anarchists, historical anarchists, to reject the word democracy itself and the idea of democracy itself. Now, in the middle of the 20th century, you have movements like, well, you had, um, if we're, you had increased communication with black liberation movements, with anti-colonial movements, and um, one philosopher who a lot of anarchists got exposed to was C.L.R. James, who was a Trinidadian socialist thinker. And he wrote a lot about direct democracy. And his writings were very influential in the Caribbean, but also outside of the Caribbean, uh, like I said. And um, basically this idea of, C.L.R. James was not an anarchist. He referred to himself as a socialist. He even called himself, he said famously, I was a Trotskyist before I met Trotsky, um, or a Trotskyist until I met Trotsky, I should say. Um, and, uh, uh, but he wrote a lot about uh, democracy as being what it, the word means, which is the people rule. And a lot of anarchists really uh, were inspired by that, this idea of the people rule. So there was this return to um, this notion of direct democracy. Um, Murray Bookchin at the same time used democracy in the same way, um, looking at the Greek root, demos kratos, the people rule. Um, and since then also like Mumia Abu Jamal uh, has written a, about uh, democracy in the same way. And um, so there was this return to this idea of seeing the word democracy as actually a fruitful battleground where we can say, okay, if the state says that it's democratic, but we know that democracy means the people rule and we don't really feel like we're the ones ruling right now. So maybe this shit isn't so democratic after all. Let's investigate what this democracy thing actually means. And then you have at the same time, you had a lot of, um, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, political scientists and professors and stuff, you see in, in some of the writing from the mid 20th century, the only people who take democracy seriously are anarchists. And I always really like that. I see that every now and then. I forget who, who wrote that one line specifically, but it's, it's really good. Um, and um, yeah, so, but there's other people um, within the anarchist movement who maintained this critique that any kind of democracy is objectionable. And personally, I haven't entirely understood that critique. I have, I have read books written 
from that perspective, including one from Crime Think uh, that came out several years ago. And um, to me, uh, it's very easy for anarchists to, to say what they're against. It's easy for anyone to say what they're against. What's difficult and necessary is to explain what it is you're for. And democracy, direct democracy, uh, helps us to do that, helps us to say, how do we want to see uh, each other relate, all of us relate to each other in a way uh, that is equal, in a way in which we can all make decisions together in a face-to-face -face and uh, um, mutually respectful way. Um, and so that's where direct democracy comes in. Um, and objections to it, in, from what I've seen, largely object to the word because it gets conflated with statecraft, uh, with, with state level politics. Um, and that's a fair enough objection. Um, but for my part, I think that um, the term is still an excellent uh, battleground itself. And, um, and it helps connect these struggles for autonomy to, like I said, uh, other freedom struggles that have been happening over the last century. Um, and uh, it's through these politics of direct democracy that, um, you know, you can see, especially for the anarchists in the room, you can see anarchism happening where there are no self-professed anarchists, um, especially in history. You know, when I got started in uh, publishing, the first book that I helped to publish was a book by UC Quayana, who was a Guyanese um, political philosopher and revolutionary who had at one time been jailed by the British during the independence struggle in Guyana. And he was writing a book about a labor strike in um, Guyana in the 70s. And I read that book, which we eventually republished. I read that book and I was like, this is anarchism. Nobody on the ground was calling themselves an anarchist, but it was it was work it was the working class trying to take control of their own lives and uh, and assert um, you know their own vision for the future uh, in a directly democratic fashion. Um, but for the anarchists who only pay attention to social movements where there are people calling themselves anarchists, your vision ends up being quite limited, and you don't get exposed to these things. I think it's very important for the movement that we do get exposed to these things. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll, with that, I'll shut up. I don't know, Naya, do you wanna say anything on that question? No, I'm good. That was great. No, it's very thorough. And thanks for the great question there, Demetrius. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left. We have another great question here. Um, so Greg asks, um, it sounds like there are good arguments to not spend time choosing between candidates and instead use the time on other sorts of political work. But what about ballot measures? Or perhaps I'll add like referendums. Um, Greg gives the example here in California, there was a statewide measure a few years ago to destroy uh, the San Francisco Bay Delta and ship the water south, but fortunately the voters saw through the deception and defeated it. Might that sort of defensive voting still be okay? I mean, my first thought is why not? I mean, it doesn't hurt you to do that at all, you know? I agree. I mean, like, I think that actually, the thing with the referendums and the ballot measures is like, you know, every so often there's somewhere within the mechanisms of the state that you might be able to assert some kind of uh, uh, resistance to some kind of policy. Um, and I think like with the referendums and ballot measures, like that can oftentimes be very important. Um, but it's also important not to confuse those with democracy, right? Because the, the fact that the referendum is even there, the way it's worded, what kinds of policies are being decided on are all decided by people over your head. And, and that, like the, the whole framing of the debate 
gets gets decided before you're even allowed to uh, vote on it. Um, so it's important to consider that. But related to referendums, like they can be very important. Um, we should also look at the referendum that was just in Kansas with regard to voting right or with uh, abortion rights. Um, that was a, a, an important victory. Um, the uh, and it's also related to abortion rights. If you look at like Southern Europe, in uh, the countries in the Catholic countries in Europe where abortion had been previously outlawed, um, anywhere that it is now legal was done through referendum. Um, and so you do sometimes have these opportunities with these referendums to show that what the people want and what representatives want are two different things. And, uh, and you can, when they allow you to, you, you, can, you can get in the way of some destructive policies or uh, reverse some destructive policies. But it, it, it's not democracy because you didn't get, that those referendums didn't come from you. They came from uh, politicians who forced it into that position because of the, whichever way the state, uh, however that particular state governs itself. You definitely yeah. have to use, I guess, some of the state violence against itself if possible. We have to observe the state and the referendums that are coming out and paying attention to what's happening so we know what we need to, to do to disrupt it. I mean, and some of them are going to be important, some of them are going to be not worth your time. But uh, it's, I think it's always a good idea to pay attention to the, those kind of ballot measures and see what's on there. Yeah, and I wonder, uh, the topic of abortion came up. Um, so, you know, I think, as we all know, uh, earlier or last month, um, you know, nine unelected members, lifelong members of the Supreme Court uh, overturned Roe v. Wade. Um, there were lots of rallies and marches and mobilizations around the country. Um, and I imagine that I was not the only one who attended rallies in which uh, some people stood up in front of the crowd and said that the thing that we had to do uh, to protect this to protect our rights to abortion um, was uh, to vote for certain candidates, primarily of the Democratic Party. Um, so what would you say to someone who in the current political climate um, said that this is a thing, we just need to hold our nose and do vote for candidates who say that they will protect those rights um, while we continue to, to fight for um, a more permanent status. You know, a Andrew had a really great story that we discussed in the very beginning stages of planning this talk. And I think that would probably be the best example, the Stacey Abrams story. Right. Um, okay. So when we talk about politicians who say that they will defend abortion rights, which has long been essentially the only um, policy difference between the Democrats and Republicans um, has been the position on uh, abortion rights. Um, and if that, if that was done honestly, if that was an honest difference of position, that would be all the excuse in my mind that one should need to uh, vote for them. Problem is, that uh, historically, Democrats have not defended abortion rights. Um, and we need only to look at the fact that they had 50 years to try to co codify uh, Roe v. Wade and didn't make a move until this year when it was already, uh, already had one foot in the grave. That being said, um, there's a more specific example uh, that I wanted to give from here in Georgia where I live and hopefully the thing won't cut us off, but. Uh, we'll see. Um, okay, Ash says we're good. Um, many, I live in Georgia, um, and here in Georgia, um, we had a really just awful election a few years back, where um, the the governor, the election for governor, 
where the, uh, the Secretary of State, Georgia, Brian Kemp, ran for governor and his opponent was a woman named Stacey Abrams. And Brian Kemp, uh, who, like I said, he was the Secretary of State, which means he, his job was being in charge of elections, did not step down to run, was basically in charge of his own election and like a bunch of polling places like shut down last minute and stuff like that. There's all sorts of corruption. He basically stole the election from Abrams. So I just want to be clear on that because I'm also going to say something uh, critical of Ms. Abrams. But I want to be clear that the election was stolen and, and, and uh, uh, if uh, the election system was not corrupt, uh, she would be governor uh, right now. Now, um, another thing that was happening around the same time was there was a, a bill that had passed the Georgia legislature called the Relig it was like um, Religious Freedom Act or something like that. Uh, and it was basically a bill that the um, right-wing legislature passed to allow business owners in Georgia to discriminate uh, against LGBT clients, basically to allow them to, uh, to refuse service uh, to queer people if they felt it, that serving these that serving queer people would violate their alleged religious freedoms. Um, that bill passed the legislature and went to the then governor, this is before Kemp was sworn in, it went into then governor uh, Nathan Deal's desk to sign. Nathan Deal had supported the bill, but the um, Georgia, if you don't already know, is a basically Hollywood 2.0 at this point. Everything is filmed here. Um, I mean, I couldn't even begin to list. People know The Walking Dead and Stranger Things and stuff like that, but everything, everything is filmed here these days because there's a huge tax break for Hollywood studios if they do a certain, depending on what percentage of the movie they shoot in Georgia. So like even something that might be filmed in various places around the world, they'll have something that they did in Georgia. Everything's filmed here. And um, at the time, a number of actors had convinced uh, Hollywood studios that they should boycott the state and they said, um, we shouldn't work in Georgia if our fellow actors or our crew or our, you know, who are queer are going to be discriminated against. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be spending these billions of dollars in the state. And, uh, and so there was a big threat of a boycott. And um, with that threat of a boycott, Nathan Deal, who loves money, uh, just like every other uh, Republican and Democrat in the legislature loves money, Nathan Deal said, okay, I'm not signing the bill, vetoed it. It was a very successful boycott. Fast forward three years. Um, and in 2019, you had uh, Stacey Abrams um, not in office, right? Stacey Abrams separately as a, as a uh, individual kind of, um, I don't know if activist is the right word, but like a, a prominent personality associated with the Democratic Party. Um, uh, Stacey Abrams had made quite a name uh, for herself in the struggle against uh, Brian Kemp. Um, there was, in 2019, there was a, a bill against, that, a bill that would criminalize abortion went through. Now at this time, Roe v. Wade was still law of the land. Um, and when this bill, this anti-abortion bill was passed in the Georgia State Legislature, um, there was, an, again, a call from the Hollywood studios and, and several actors to pull out of Georgia. Um, but this time, uh, Stacey Abrams traveled, flew to Hollywood quite publicly. It's quite a show about it. It was in all the papers. Flew to Hollywood, met with several executives, and convinced them not to pull out of Georgia to, quote, stay and fight. Stay and fight means nothing. It's all stay, it's no fight. And what happened there is shortly thereafter that meeting, since the threat of the boycott was now gone, the uh, anti-abortion bill passed. Now, um, it was immediately blocked by the courts. Um, but as we all know, Roe v. Wade got overturned. And now we live in a state here in Georgia where uh, one of several states that where uh, abortions are, I mean, it's, there's still some court fights happening, but it's a losing battle. And we're, we're going to have essentially no legal route to abortion in Georgia. And um, 
Stacey Abrams and the Democratic Party uh, who were desperate to keep that billions of dollars in Georgia have a huge hand in that. They undermined the boycott that we know could have prevented this bill from passing. We know it because it had worked three years earlier in, in exact, almost the exact same scenario. Um, and so when we talk about voting for candidates who will defend abortion rights, you have to, if you're going to actually do that, you have to look beyond what party they're in and even beyond what they say they're for, because it's quite common that you'll have these, that these candidates, they will do things that are politi politically expedient for them at the time. No politician wanted to be the one who supported a boycott of their state because people's jobs might be on the line and then somebody might lose their job if the boycott happened, right? Now, of course, a boycott is a tactic and it's a, it's a game of chicken, right? And just like in 2016, the boycott didn't actually have to happen because the governor vetoed the bill, right? And when you have a boycott, you're betting that that's what's gonna happen. But um, we didn't even get to that point because the uh, Democratic Party undermined uh, the boycott effort. And it's very important for people to know that um, because I, I mean, Ms. Abrams is, is going to be a governor. Uh, I'm, I'm certain of it. Um, someday she might be president. And like people need to know that this happened. And, uh, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's a very, it's a very disturbing case in Georgia. And, you know, I have a, I have a young daughter and I, the whole thing just, it, it just really troubles me. And, and when that happened, I was like, oh my God, well, at least Roe v. Wade is still in place. And then now look where the fuck we are. So it's, it's quite disturbing, but I'm sorry I talked so much. Nani, uh, uh, please. You muted yourself. <laughs> no, I wanted you to talk about, about that story because when we were uh, planning this, it was, you know, I feel like we had to talk about the Supreme Court and Andrew's like, I have such a great story um, to share and so. I'm happy that you shared it. Um, you know, I used to live in Georgia as well. And now I live in Maryland and it's a different kind of state here. So, I mean, it's just, it's a real struggle, but that's a great example of how the Democratic Party is, you know, not fixing anything, not protecting anything. And you need only to look at like old news articles too, like look at what Barack Obama said about codifying Roe v. Wade back in 2009. He said straight up, not a priority, even though he ran on it. Uh, look at Nancy Pelosi, said the same thing, what, two years ago? Not a priority. Um, I mean, and it, it goes on and on and on. And yet people assume that these are the folks who are going to defend abortion rights. I, I don't know where they get that idea. I mean, you know, you have some people who seem very personally attached to defending abortion rights, like, you know, like say Elizabeth Warren and stuff like that. But like, I, you know, aside from, one or two cases, there's there hasn't been any concerted effort to defend abortion rights by the Democratic Party. Um, but I, I would be happy to be proven wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reminded there of uh, your the socialist you were playing who admitted the fact that the elections were all propaganda in the first place. Uh, so, I, you know, folks will say what they need to say in order to get in there, but then they'll do what they ultimately want to do. And we've seen that time and time again. Um, well, that seems like a good place to wrap up for the evening. We're a little bit over time. Uh, so I feel uh, really grateful and appreciative of everyone who's still here with us. Um, we could probably go on for much longer it's a big conversation, uh, but that's why that's why the book exists. Um, so I hope folks, uh, if you haven't picked up a copy yet, uh, you will. I also drop links to kind of a bunch of the books, um, Intimate Direct Democracy and Deciding for Ourselves and Anarchism and Its Aspiration. I drop links in the chat there. Um, so if you want further reading beyond uh, this collection here, those are all great suggestions um, to check out. So Nani, Andrew, thanks so much for putting the volume together. Thanks for taking the time to be here tonight, share your thoughts with us, uh, do a reading for us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Ash. It's lovely as always.
Absolutely. Um, and, and as always, I uh, really look forward to future collaborations and also hope to see you in person uh, someday soon. Uh, sounds like we're all in the South or South region. Um, so it'd be wonderful to see you perhaps in Firestorm's new space in 2023. Yo, Nani, Asheville's like right between Baltimore and Atlanta. Just trying to oh yeah, let's go there. Let's go there. We should do it. Oh, and everyone who registered for this event, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Um, so if there's anything you missed or anything you want to double check, you'll be able to watch it again. Um, and I hope that will be a valuable tool for you to share with people as well uh, who need a reference on this, this topic. Definitely. All right, y'all. Have a good night. Thanks again so much. Goodbye now. Thank you. Bye.